So we have less people today, maybe because of weather, maybe? Yeah. yeah. So um, basically, this is the uh, air masses. We are talking about climate uh, right now, our final topic, um, next few classes, right? Um, so basically, whenever we have bad weather in Southern California, so air masses in uh, near uh, here, North Pacific, is rolling along all the way out to the uh, Southern California. Sometimes that effect on the uh, um, Southern California, making some rain, things like that. So um, this thing, over this Arctic air masses, this polar air masses, kind of expanding uh, towards the uh, um, U.S. Um, uh, during the winter time, so that's what caused the uh, rain and then a little bit chilly air in California even. And then most of the country, in the middle part of the country, gets very cold, right, um, during the winter time. Um, actually, past week, there, are, there is an interesting uh, weather phenomenon. It's not really interesting for the people who get affected. Um, tornado actually was found in Illinois. So um, let's take a look at this news about that uh, weather. Out almost in slow motion from west to east across the Midwest on a Sunday afternoon in November. It was hard to believe, really, a wild outbreak of tornadoes. What the weather forecasting business... Hmm. Oops. No, no, no. ...caused a second season outbreak in a place where they assumed the danger had passed for this year. So far, dozens of tornadoes have been confirmed yesterday, along with eight deaths, most of them in Illinois, after rough weather that stretched across 12 states in all, and all in the space of one strangely violent day. We begin our coverage tonight with NBC's Kevin Tibbles in Pekin, Illinois. Kevin, good evening. Brian, tonight here in Pekin, in Washington, and in dozens of other Midwestern communities, the shock of what this massive storm has done is only now beginning to set in. Large areas of Washington, Illinois, look like a moonscape today, as some residents take through the wreckage of what used to be their homes. Andrea Bell is like so many others, huddled in the basement. She held on to her three-month-old daughter with all her money. The windows flew out, and we just huddled together and went on top of her daughter. <laughs> and uh, everything started falling in. By the time this massive storm roared through Illinois, six people were dead. Among the victims, Amy Tippin's grandmother, Frances Hoy, and her great-uncle, Joseph Hoy, of New Minden. She just kept saying, I want out of here, I want out of here. But their farmhouse could not withstand the strength of the storm. After surveying the damage up close, I got to see it from the bottom. I've never seen the aftermath of the air like this before. It's almost as if a bulldozer is just run from one end of town right through the other and then far off as far as the eye can see in the other direction. And then, of course, there are the, the power towers, which are just on the ground and twisted up like pretzels. These things are made out of steel. The storm moved so quickly, residents only had minutes after the sirens went off including the anchors at this Peoria TV station. I am hearing things right now, Chuck. Yes. I think we, um, we may need to take shelter right yes. now ourselves. We do. We need to go we off do. the air. Yeah. We will be back when we can. Our father, as the giant twisters approach, worried bears are heard in this cell phone video. They will be done. It's coming fast. And for those on the road, a desperate rush to safety. Go, 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 go. In neighboring Indiana, Phyllis Rollins of Kokomo says she's still in shock. This was where the helm was standing. The roof was completely taken out, and there is nothing, as you can see, left. Nothing except for this Christmas ornament with her late husband's photo. After 42 years together, he passed away last year. I had a great loss when I lost him, and now this is another loss that I will make it with God's help. They may have lost all their worldly possessions, but they survived. Look at that. Like, it's a miracle that anybody would walk out of that alive. Schools and churches have now hastily been turned into emergency shelters for those who've had everything stolen from them by this storm. 
Brian Tibble starting us off. Peak in Illinois tonight. What an unbelievable scene. Kevin, thanks. This bears repeating. A string of tornadoes 11 days before Thanksgiving. A very rare occurrence in the world of weather. And Weather Channel meteorologist Mike Seidel, who was out in it last night, can underscore this point tonight. He's in Kokomo, Indiana tonight. Hey, Mike, good evening. Hey, Brian, good evening. Two tornadoes rolled through the Kokomo landscape late yesterday afternoon. They were both EF2s with winds as high as 135 miles an hour. One of those came right across here, moving at 60 miles an hour. That's interstate speed. It blew the rolling south to smithereens off the foundation. Five went into the basement. They all survived. The house behind me and part of it over here on the railroad tracks of all places. This is very unusual to see twisters this late in the season. We typically see them in the deep south in November, but yesterday was not your typical November day. You went outside at sunrise in the Midwest, it was in the 60s, 25 degrees above average. Then you throw in that roaring jet stream aloft, 150 mile an hour winds five miles up, and even a mile above the surface, the winds were blowing at 60 to 70 miles an hour, but from a different direction. So you get the twisting and turning, and you get those unusual EF4s. In fact, Illinois had two of those, They've never seen those on record since 1950. Brian Mike Seidel. Seidel made the wreckage in Kokomo. For so, Mike, obviously, tornado, hurricane, things like that, even today's rain in Southern California are all uh, weather phenomena. So, um, it is very di difficult to tie one event uh, with the uh, climate change, things like that. So, uh, especially the tornado event is very difficult to predict. And then um, uh, still scientists has very hard time to uh, connect that tornado events and uh, climate change. So in other words, whether climate change affect on the uh, more tornado, things like that, we don't have good answer for uh, that question. So um, the reason we have tornado in middle part of the country is that whenever we have this uh, very hot, humid air over the Gulf of Mexico getting into the continent, and then that air masses mixed with this uh, uh, polar air, then uh, some swirling motion of the, uh, um, the um, very regional kind of vortex happening. Once that thing is, gets touched down, then that's by uh, definition um, the uh, a tornado. So one very striking thing is that usually during the winter time, um, this uh, air mass is so strong that so uh, not much of this hot and humid air can get into the continent that cause the uh, um, tornado. But at this time, this 11 days before the uh, Thanksgiving, actually that things happen, so it is kind of a big surprise. So um, a lot of scientists are working on to predict the uh, tornado event, whether that's related with the uh, climate change or not. But at this time point, we don't have good answer for that. So that's the uh, current state status right now. So that's it. So we are now talking about climate change. So before we discuss about climate change, we at least need to understand climate. So what's the climate? So basically climate is the, uh, you can just think that that's the temperature over the earth. So uh, temperature over the earth, pretty much def uh, de defined by the how much energy we are getting from the sun because earth doesn't emit producing an any energy by itself, at least in terms of IR. Uh, deep down the earth, it's very hot. If you take a look at the volcano event, things like that, a lot of molten rock is coming out from the surface. But um, uh, basically, earth's surface is co completely isolated. So those uh, very hot temperature cannot actually transfer to the uh, earth's surface. So, uh, so you can understand that temperature over the uh, earth's surface is pretty much dictated by how much energy we are getting from the sun. So let's take a look at the sun side of the story. So most, uh, what's the most dominant um, energy um, characteristic that sun is emitting toward the Earth? Visible, right? Visible and a little bit of UV, but mostly uh, visible. Um, so um, in terms of total energy, this is total energy that we are getting from the sun. So 342 watts per square meter. And uh, some of the, this uh, energy it's not observed by the Earth. So um, Earth actually observed this much of the energy, 168 out of 342. And then atmosphere actually observed about uh, 67. And then less of them are reflected away by cloud and then by the surface. So about one, 107. So it's about 
of their total energy got reflected away uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the Earth. So we call it the ratio, basically percentage of the uh, uh, total reflection without uh, absorption, call it albedo. So this is unilist number. So in this case, albedo should be total energy coming in, right? 3042, and then total energy coming out, 107. And then whatever number it is, that's albedo, okay? So that's the uh, definition. So that's some side of the story. So <clears throat> total energy that Earth is observing is emitting by the Earth in what wavelength? Toward IR, right? Infrared. So that's basically heat. Um, so because of we have layer of the atmosphere, there's some interaction between uh, energy from the Earth and then energy uh, from the atmosphere. So a lot of the energy that uh, is emitted by the uh, Earth actually absorbed by the atmosphere, mostly by greenhouse gases, it can re it to the uh, uh, Earth too. So that's by definition, greenhouse effect. We will talk about this thing a little uh, later. So uh, basically everything, so layer above the uh, Earth and then out of the atmosphere, if you just add it up, all the, this atmosphere is getting in terms of energy, and then uh, how much energy is actually getting out from the atmosphere and the Earth's surface, it's all balanced, okay? But uh, the layer of atmosphere actually heating up over the Earth's surface. So there's some, a lot of arrows. So one thing you need to understand is that about one third of the uh, solar energy is not absorbed by the uh, Earth. It's reflected away, and then uh, we call it albedo, the ratio of the, uh, uh, the energy reflected away from the Earth, and then um, total energy that uh, illuminated to the, uh, to the Earth, that's the albedo. And then there's a, a layer of the atmosphere. It's absorbing some of the energy that uh, emitted by the Earth, that that uh, energy actually re, uh, emit towards the uh, Earth's surface, that is basically heating up the uh, Earth's surface, then that's uh, by definition greenhouse effect, okay? So, um, so uh, this is basically what determines Earth's climate. And then we talked about greenhouse gases, it's absorbing IR, and then re-emitting those energy to the uh, surface, that's heating up the uh, Earth's surface. So um, currently we are thinking the increase of the greenhouse gases, so we'll discuss about it a little further, actually uh, increasing the mean temperature of the Earth um, toward the uh, uh, um, high temperature range. So that means that we actually uh, watched that uh, uh, news clip uh, year 2012 that we have more record hot weather than the uh, uh, record, record cold weather. So that's by definition, if you just make the statistics, uh, if you take a look at the statistics of the uh, temperature over the uh, global uh, range, then uh, actually that uh, temperature is moving towards the uh, hotter side. So this doesn't mean that you are not gonna have any cold weather due to um, um, climate change or global warming. That's wrong statement, because we will still have some um, statistically uh, abnormal data point that someday we will have uh, a cold weather, but uh, uh, likely that we will have less cold days compared with the uh, uh, hot days that uh, during this transition of the uh, uh, climate change. So one thing we need to uh, really think about is that those climate change is really human caused or natural change. So that's something that we will uh, discuss about today. So that's one of the examples, actually. So um, in Colorado, when I live in Colorado, this was my backyard in early October, I think even late September. Uh, so basically all uh, trees had the uh, leaves at that day. Uh, in, the, uh, in this early uh, uh, fall, we usually don't have a, a snowstorm 
at that date. That kind of early uh, fall. But this early October or late September day, we got a lot of dump of snow there, and then we have all, all sort of broken branches, things like that. So this is kind of one day event. So basically, I think one, this one day, basically we had, I think about half of the total uh, snow uh, precipitation for the whole season. So in terms of a statistical approach, Colorado really worried about uh, the snow uh, for during winter time is getting decreased due to climate change. And then obviously, especially towards the mountain range uh, uh, region, they are depending on the, uh, the ski resort economy and then uh, visitors during the winter time, things like that. So that's gonna hit hard um, in Colorado, in mountain range, in terms of long-term um, climate change impacts that uh, statistically, the yearly average we got less and less snow in Colorado. But one day, we have a lot, a lot of snow. So day by day, there can be a day by day variation. But if you take a look at the long term average, we are getting uh, less snow uh, in the mountain range. So that's one uh, kind of uh, aspects of the snow. If you love the uh, um, skiing, then uh, that's a very sad thing. But you, know, you cannot live without skiing. But the a real problem is we are using this snow uh, uh, melt, w melted water uh, for our use. So it is especially in California, we rely on water source uh, from the, uh, the uh, snow on top of the uh, mountain. So this can be a big problem that uh, we, got, we are having less snow uh, year by year uh, um, these days in western part of the US. So that's the uh, uh, one story about climate change also. So this is the uh, uh, most striking probably uh, data set that you can see. So um, we talked about this thing last class. This is the temperature variation per thousand years. So um, although we don't have any record on global uh, temperature uh, observation data set thousand years before, but still we can reconstruct uh, temperature, for example, using the, uh, um, that ice core, or we can take a look at the uh, uh, tree rings, things like that. So this is the best data that we have, the science can provide so far, the temperature of the past uh, thousand years. So uh, before late 1800, basically temperature has been decreased. Obviously there's year by year variation. There, there's big year by year, uh, year by year variation there. But if you take a look at, at the uh, statistical approach, then uh, it has been decreasing in terms of temperature. But, um, from the uh, late 1800, which was uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the temperature got jumped up. So um, today's class is we uh, kind of uh, try to time with this uh, temperature increase past about uh, uh, 200 years with increase of the uh, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, methane, and N2O. So this is the, uh, uh, the one that I explained already. So sun is emitting mostly visible wavelengths. So this uh, visible wavelengths, most of the energy on the visible wavelengths range, this is the uh, most intense energy from the sun. And this uh, visible wavelengths range can actually get into the Earth's surface without any filtering. So for example, UV got filtered by, by ozone layer, right? But this energy range is uh, getting all the way bottom to the uh, 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 Earth's surface without that much of the filtering, okay? And the Earth, the peak wavelength of the Earth is about 10 micrometer, and then energy, why it is so shaky? It's very dizzy. Um, uh, <clears throat> So total amount of energy compared with the sun is very, very tiny because you know, our sun's temperature is 6,000 Kelvin and then Earth's temperature is 300 Kelvin. There's big uh, temperature differences. And then that's one thing that Earth is emitting much, much small amount of energy compared with the sun. But uh, the other implication is that uh, the uh, wavelengths is much, much longer. Wavelength is dominant in Earth's uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And then that happened to be IR, right? So um, that's sensible heat. 
So this is a, a real uh, energy comparison. So to compare sun and earth you know, side by side, we normalize it. And then uh, basically, we just uh, pick the number the here and here. So we divided this curve with the uh, peak number right there so that the highest uh, uh, energy becomes 1. So that we can just compare side by side. So this is normalized energy distribution. So sun's energy is more towards the shorter wavelength region, which is uh, higher energy uh, electromagnetic radiation. And then again, this is uh, visible wavelength region. And then this is IR. And then on the bottom, we call it emissivity. So uh, in plain English, what this uh, emissivity means that if it is one, atmosphere is basically observing the whole thing, whole chunk of energy in this wavelength region. So for example, below uh, about 240, right? 240 uh, nanometer, all the energy from the sun got filtered away by molecular oxygen and ozone. So we already talked about it. So basically, a uh, uh, stratospheric ozone layer is filtering this energy out. So uh, not much of the energy below 250 or even 300 will get down to the uh, uh, Earth's surface, right? And then that emissivity dropped like this. So that means this chunk of the energy is going to get down to the Earth's surface, right? So uh, what is this wavelength region? What is, what, what is this thing? Visible, right? So visible, so that's why we can see each other during the daytime, right? So this thing is coming down to the surface. So let's take a look at this Earth's uh, radiation right here. So basically here, 50 micrometer and higher are all observed by the uh, water by rotational transition. We talked about the, uh, the vibrational transition and rotational transition. That's the uh, um, kind of a um, molecular motion that can be activated by the uh, IR or uh, radio uh, wavelength range. So um, basically IR is the, uh, the energy uh, Earth is emitting. So um, the uh, vibrational and rotational transition is important thing uh, to understand greenhouse uh, effect. So, uh, so that means that the energy, this chunk of the energy is going to be absorbed by the atmosphere, right? By the uh, transition, rotational transition of water. And then this part, which happened to be the peak wavelength region of the Earth electromagnetic radiation. So basically about 20% of this wavelength region, we call it atmospheric window, is absorbed by the atmosphere, okay? And mostly by CO2, ozone, methane, and N2O. So the three gases you need to remember, CO2, N2O, and methane. And then they are absorbing uh, in the atmosphere uh, this wavelength re region between about 9 to about 20 micrometer that happens to be the highest energy that Earth is emitting. And then um, that absorbs the, uh, uh, that IR uh, wavelength region and then re-emitting towards the Earth's surface. Basically, that's heating up the Earth, okay? So um, I think I showed this thing last time again. So basically, Let's, let's do a simple calculation with the two uh, different scenarios. One is Earth without uh, atmosphere, okay? Let's assume Earth uh, doesn't have atmosphere. Then uh, the energy from the sun absorbed by, atmosphere or by the Earth, and then that's going to be emitting uh, directly uh, to the uh, space because there's no atmosphere uh, over, over the Earth. So if we just set the equation and then solve this thing, it's relatively easy. It's about 255 Kelvin, which is well below the uh, uh, melting point. So basically, there's, there's not gonna, we, we are not going to have any uh, liquid water over the Earth. So basically, uh, uh, the life form cannot be sustained by uh, this low temperature. But if we assume the atmosphere now, 
and then uh, if we plug in the older right number, so basically uh, this kind of model, so basically we just adding the layer of atmosphere, and then we are just basically putting all this number in that equation, and then see what's going to be the temperature of the atmosphere, and then temperature over the Earth. So basically this uh, temperature over the Earth from this calculation means that um, how much atmosphere is actually heating up the Earth's surface by greenhouse e uh, effect, right? So if we, if we just plug in the older number, I don't expect you can you know, actually uh, set this equation and then solve the number. But this is a good number to remember. So if there's no uh, atmosphere, it's about 255. So don't even need to remember the number. Rather, you, can, uh, you should remember that if there's no atmosphere, the Earth's surface uh, temperature is going to be below the uh, uh, water's melting point. So every water form over the Earth is going to be ice, right? You can, you can remember that part, right? And then uh, thanks to the atmosphere, thanks to uh, uh, greenhouse e uh, effect, the temperature over the Earth is 288 now, well over the uh, uh, melting point. So now we can have liquid water over the, uh, over the Earth. So uh, it can, uh, sus Earth can sustain a, a life over the Earth's surface, right? So that's the... Uh, 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 greenhouse effect, and then that's actually in natural condition, that's very uh, essential thing to have life over the earth, okay? So I talked about we need, so there's a, uh, this most discussion of this class is going to be CO2, methane, and a little bit of N2O. So, um, so we talked about the vibrational transition. So if you take a look at this, um, Molecule, CO2 looks like this, methane looks like this, and then N2O looks like this. So this molecule all can have a uh, so vibrational uh, transition. So this can, you know, doing like this and like this. This thing do, you know, something like this doing the uh, vibration. So basically this kind of molecular motion is absorbing the uh, IR energy. So that's a quantum mechanical view of the, uh, why this gas molecule can absorb IR wavelength region by the, uh, um, by the uh, well, vibrational uh, transition. So if you take a look at the uh, oxygen, you cannot make really vibration with this thing, right? And then nitrogen. So you cannot really make the uh, asymmetric vibration with this molecule. So this molecule cannot be the uh, greenhouse gases, OK? And then if we take a look at the uh, just one molecule, one molecule, one molecule each, uh, the potential that this molecule can warm up the atmosphere is defined by this. So CO2, 1.4 times 10 to minus 5 watt per square meter per ppb. And then um, methane is 3.7 times 10 to minus 4, same unit. And then N2O So you can understand this is energy. Uh, that uh, warming up the atmosphere. And then this is area. And then this is concentration, mixing ratio, right? So according to this, which molecule has most potential to warm up the atmosphere? Anybody can answer just by seeing this number? You know the clicker? Anybody can brave to explain to everybody what is what? Again, energy. So basically this energy can be defined by how much it can warm up the atmosphere, okay? 
this is given area, and this is concentration. So let me rephrase the question. If atmosphere has same concentration of this thing, CO2 and methane and N2O, which one is most serious greenhouse gases that can warm up the atmosphere? If we have same concentration of CO2, methane, and N2O. So this number indicates that energy that heated up the atmosphere, right? Which one is most highest energy then? Which one is most high energy? Right? This, this is most. Uh, highest energy that can warm up the uh, atmosphere, right? So basically this is the most serious greenhouse gas if we have same concentration of all three these three gases in the atmosphere, right? So now let's factor in the concentration, okay? Depends on where you are, it can change, but in global average, uh, this is about now, safely say 400 ppm. Methane, 1.9 ppm. N2O, 300 ppb, which is 0.3 ppm. So which one is most serious greenhouse gas now, if you factor in their concentration? CO2? Which one is number two? Yeah, methane, number three, okay? So, I can see a lot of confused face. No? What is this thing? Anybody has calculator? Basically, you can multiply by this and that, then that's the uh, amount of the energy that warms up the atmosphere by this molecule, right? What's the number? Shoot me. Five point six times ten to the negative three. Five point six times ten to minus what? Minus three. Three? How about this one? What, what's the number? You, you, you are playing with the, uh, your calculator. No? You are texting your friends or something? I thought you were calculating this thing. <laughs> what's the number for this? Let's say it's two. OK? Then uh, this is uh, 7.4, right? 10 to minus 4. 0.3? 909 times 10 to minus 4, right? Actually, N2O is number 2 here. Is that right? Yeah. So N2O, in this calculation, N2 is the second most important um, greenhouse gas, right? And then this is number 1, and then this is number 3. OK, but this is kind of uh, about the same. OK, if we factor in the uh, concentration. So understand this thing? So molecular characteristic defines the potential how much that one molecule can warm up the atmosphere. But that's important factor. But another very important factor is how much of the, these gases are in the atmosphere. But in terms of the molecular perspective, CO2 may be least um, effective greenhouse gas in among those three gases, but CO2 simply has too high concentrations, so that's the number one problem in terms of global warming, right? Okay? But global warming is not necessarily a bad thing. Without greenhouse effect, then we cannot live on over the atmosphere in this warm weather. So uh, the problem is that excess amount of the CO2 and the methane and 2 o 
heating up the atmosphere too much, and then that caused the, uh, um, start to cause the uh, problem. So let's kind of a change our view from the Earth to other planet on the Earth system. So um, not Earth system, solar system. So we'll just compare Venus, Earth, and Mars. So obviously this is Venus, and this is Earth, and this is Mars, right? So um, this is the thing we need to consider. So uh, on Venus, uh, with respect to Earth, it has nine times higher pressure on the surface. So what does this mean? So we have Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then each has atmosphere. And then in terms of the pressure, Earth is 1, this is 90, and then this 0.007, right? So that means that plane of Venus has 90 times more air molecule than Earth, right? Right? That's by definition this pressure is indicating. And then Mars is about 0.7% of the uh, um, air molecule in Mars atmosphere, right? That's uh, by definition of the pressure. So this pressure indicating that how, much, how many air molecules in each planet's Earth atmosphere, right? Okay? And then let's take a look at the uh, air composition. So in Venus, so there's Venus, at, Venus atmosphere, 96% of Venus atmosphere is CO2, which is effective greenhouse gas. And then Mars is about the same uh, case, 95% of the Mars atmosphere is CO2. But over the Earth is 400 ppm. So this is tiny fraction, so that's 400 ppm. So let's do this. 95%, this is 400 ppm. And then this is, what? 95% again. So this equilibrium temperature, 252, 255, and 217 Kelvin is basically this scenario without atmosphere, okay? So without atmosphere, our equilibrium temperature of Venus is 252, 255, and then Mars is 217, all below melting point, right? But we just calculated this 288 number because Earth's atmosphere is subserving some of the uh, radiation IR radiation from the uh, Earth's surface, and then that re-emitting that energy to the surface that heats up the uh, Earth's surface, right? So um, uh, mainly by CO2, okay? And then let's take a look at the Venus. It has mostly uh, composed by uh, the CO2, 96%, and then total air molecule in given volume uh, Venus has 90 times more CO2 in their atmosphere, right? So if you factor in this more CO2 and then more air molecule, which means that Venus has, Venus's atmosphere, there's a lot of CO2 uh, in the Venus's atmosphere. So that cause excess, excess the uh, um, um, greenhouse effect so uh, increase the actual temperature as much as uh, 730 uh, Kelvin. So that's very hot temperature, right? So that's mainly due to CO2. And then you got to take a look at both in pressure and then uh, the fraction of gases of a CO2. Let's move back to the Mars. Mars atmosphere also has 95% of CO2 in terms of composition, but the pressure is tiny fraction, right? So that means 
if you just take a look at the uh, uh, in given volume, CO2, number of CO2 molecule is not gonna that many. So there's not much difference between equilibrium temperature and actual temperature. So that means that there's a less greenhouse uh, effect is going on in Mars atmosphere because air is too thin, okay? So um, this is the, uh, how you can see the uh, greenhouse effect, okay? Too many numbers? <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is boring parts. So we'll take a look at some fun things actually for today. So we'll, let's take a look at the CO2. So we talked about the, uh, uh, the temperature increase happened to be immediately after uh, uh, industrial revolution. So if, you, if we just uh, reconstruct CO2 concentration or emission to the atmosphere, um, CO2 emission has been constant. Basically, this is our baseline before human emitting CO2 excessively after uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution. So uh, late 70, uh, 1750, the cement production is started. So the total CO2 emission has been increased. And then this green line basically indicates the uh, solid fuels. That's mostly coal, okay? So uh, CO2 has been, had been mostly uh, emitted by the coal until uh, maybe 1870. And then we start to have the liquid fuel. In this case, it's gasoline or diesel, things like that, right? So uh, that also emitting the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, but compared with the uh, 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 solid fuel, before 1950, it was dominated by the solid fuel, but 1950, actual liquid fuel just took over. So currently, most dominant uh, CO2 emission is liquid fuel, which is uh, gasoline um, to the atmosphere. So uh, we actually, this is the same slide that I showed you, um, I think second, third class, I think, of this quarter. So, um, and then during the midterm, actually, I asked about based on the um, definition of CO, uh, uh, air pollution, try to uh, um, think about whether CO2 is air pollutants or not. I realized there's a lot of uh, students answer that CO2 is not air pollutant. So um, as long as you answer based on your definition, I just made it correct. But um, you may have some different answer. <laughs> Uh, after you learn this um, global climate change thing. So basically CO2 is never actually uh, accumulated that much high concentration in normal condition that may affect you on your health. So in that perspective, it may not be a, um, it may not be a, um, a pollutants, but it can obviously increase the uh, 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 Earth's temperature. So if you think that global warming is pollution, then uh, CO2 uh, can be definitely air pollutant. So that's your judgment call. Um, so this is reservoir, but this is all the number. You may, you may think this is meaningless, so let's just go directly dive into the, this um, uh, uh, kind of a um, view on um, CO2 emissions and then uptake by the uh, many different sectors. So we are worrying about the emission from the human act activity, right? So that's composed about six uh, petagrams per year, carbon per year. So compared with the other um, um, flux, like soil aspiration, so definitely this is the natural uh, process, or photosynthesis, or even volcano, uh, this may not be that big number. And then another important uh, factor here is that ocean uptake and ocean uh, loss. So ocean plays a very important role in terms of CO2 distribution over the Earth. Just like photosynthesis, ocean actually uptakes a lot of CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. But at the same time, ocean is emitting a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere, okay? So if you take a look at these two numbers, uptake and then um, emission to the atmosphere in terms of CO2, in net, there's a two, two uh, picogram uh, carbon per year amount of CO2 actually dissolved into the uh, ocean, right? So basically, uh, ocean is CO2 sink. 
So um, human emitting about six, and then ocean is uptaking about two, which means that if this process got seized some reason, then um, the CO2 uh, concentration increase in the atmosphere is going to be much faster, right? If ocean is not taking up about two of the out of six, then it's going to be much faster, right? Everybody can get that. So this is the, uh, uh, the thing that uh, the increase of the CO2 is caused by the uh, human, obviously uh, human activity, and then the annual cycle can be explained by the uh, photosynthesis during the uh, summer time. So, uh, tr so try not to bring the CO2 of the uh, fossil fuel form of carbon to the atmosphere. So basically biofuel is trying to capture that uh, CO2 in the atmosphere by photosynthesis. So using this bio uh, material to make the uh, fuel to run the our car. So that's the uh, big, big concept of this biofuel. So we talked about this thing. So let's talk about this ocean uh, CO2 pumping stuff. So ocean ha has potential, a lot of potential to uh, actually uh, absorb CO2 from the atmosphere by these chemical processes. We uh, took a look at these chemical processes when we discussed about uh, um, acid rain, right? So basically, CO2 can be taken up to the water, and then it can dissolve to the water like this. So first thing you need to remember is that CO2 actually makes water acidic, right? It provides the uh, H plus to the water, and then uh, it will make the uh, uh, ocean acidic if we have too much of CO2. Currently, our ocean water is a little bit basic uh, in terms of pH. I think 7.5 or 8 is the uh, um, current uh, ocean pH. So one thing you need to remember, that too much of CO2 will ocean acidic, OK? That has really, really big implication. Uh, we'll take a look at this uh, uh, video um, pretty soon. And then another thing is that if there's a too much of CO2 in the atmosphere, so these are all equilibrium, not just one A process. If there's a too much of CO2, then equilibrium may shift towards the dead side. So that means that ocean will stop absorbing the CO2 from the atmosphere in some time point. We don't know what, when it's then. So there are two implications in this uh, uh, chem uh, chemistry. One is CO2 making ocean acidic. And then the other one is, this is these are all equilibri equilibrium processes. So if you have too much of CO2, ocean may stop absorbing a CO2 in some time point. So we don't know when that is. So let's take a look at this video about uh, implication of ocean acidification a little bit. So let's go out. <laughs> so any shellfish fan in this uh, room here? Take a look at this thing. Let's go. Pacific oysters like the ones grown on Shinawasaki's family farm near Olympia, Washington, are served in restaurants around the country. We think our water tastes great here, and that makes our oysters taste great. But there's trouble in the water. The ocean's pH, which measures the level of acidity of a liquid, shows the water is becoming acidified. Most growers like the Wasakis can only farm oysters if they can buy oyster larvae, also called oyster seed from hatcheries. But a few years ago, the larvae suddenly began dying by the billions. The culprit? The seawater pumped into the hatcheries is so corrosive that it eats away the young oyster shells before they can form. Ocean acidification is this huge problem, and there's so many things. It's the currents, it's the carbon dioxide, it's the ardenite, and it's most of which I understand a tiny fraction of. But what I do understand is 
when a nursery calls on the phone and says there's no oyster seed to ship. We don't have any. Seed production in the Northwest plummeted by as much as 80% between 2005 and 2009. And what we found was just very dramatic. When the waters were highly corrosive, the organisms died within two days. The oyster larvae just simply died. When the water was high pH, they did just fine. It was just like a switch. That switch is happening around the world as oceans take in large amounts of carbon dioxide, or CO2, says Dick Feely, a senior scientist at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Over the last 200 years or so, we've released about 2 trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And about a quarter of that, or 550 billion tons of carbon dioxide, have been absorbed by the oceans. All that CO2 changes the chemistry of the water by making it more acidic, 30% more since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Because of natural tide and wave patterns, the Pacific Northwest coast has been hit hardest, with corrosive water being brought up from the deep ocean to the surface where shellfish live. That's why Washington's shellfish industry, worth $270 million a year and responsible for thousands of jobs, is the first to feel the effects of this global phenomenon, says Bill Dewey of Taylor Shellfish, the largest producer of farm shellfish in the country. In a single night, Taylor's growers will bring in about 50,000 oysters. This is the first place these deep corrosive waters are coming to the surface. And you know, we're uh, an industry that relies on calcifiers, so we're the first to see the effects and scream about it. Ocean acidification acts a lot like osteoporosis, the condition that causes bones to become brittle in humans. For oysters, scallops, and other shellfish, lower pH means less carbonate, which they rely on to build their essential shells. As acidity increases, shells become thinner, growth slows down, and death rates rise. With oysters, the vulnerable stage that's, that dissolves in these corrosive waters is the very, very young stage. They're using a form of calcium carbonate to build their shell that dissolves really easily. On the East Coast, growers are starting to worry that they'll be hit next. New Bedford, Massachusetts is America's top producing fishing port, and sea scallops, another species vulnerable to acidification, makes up 77% of their production. Shell fishing is, is really a way of life for many of those families and much of that community. And taking that away further homogenizes our country. We can see changes in the demographics of the community as working families move away. Sarah Cooley studies the socioeconomic impacts of altered oceans at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. She and other researchers project acidification could reduce U.S. shellfish harvests by as much as 25% over the next 50 years. We'll look back and say, oh, things used to be like this. And I hope that's not the case. I hope we can actually preserve those pockets of individuality in the country that make it so great um, by finding these regional solutions that can um, help out different regions um, to preserve their, their ways of life. But what we're looking at is probably on the order of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars just related to the shellfish fishery in this country alone, because it's a $740 million industry. Oystermen have been working with scientists to find ways to adapt. Hatcheries now monitor seawater and only allow it in when acidity levels are lower. They're also adding sodium carbonate and eelgrass to help balance the pH levels. That's helped growers recover nearly 75% of their losses. But Dick Feely says that strategy won't work in the future when scientific models show corrosive waters will become more pervasive at the sea surface. Because as we continue to release more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, and that will be taken up by the oceans, eventually the oceans will be corrosive 50% of the time, 60% of the time. Within the next 30 or 40 years, this will be a 100 to 150 percent increase of the acidity of the oceans by the end of the centuries. This is a very dramatic change that has not been seen in, in the world oceans for more than 50 million years. For shellfish growers, the future is now. You know, this is a very real problem, and, and we hope that people pay attention to the canary in the coal mine here. Washington State recently convened a panel of policymakers and scientists to develop long-term strategies to the problem. 
and scientists are still learning more about how the impacts of acidification will ripple through the entire food web of the ocean. But oystermen already know this is just the beginning of a long-term struggle. So not only this, um, there's uh, another news clip here about the, uh, um, the impacts of ocean acidification on uh, coral reef uh, community. So is there anybody's first thought was like, you know, I don't like seafood, so why should I care about it? Anybody thought that way? No? Maybe you may think like that way, but uh, um, here's the catch. So um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, when we worried about CO2, this ocean acidification thing was not that actually a big research topic at the time. Because we didn't know ocean is going to be actually get acidified that much, and then we will feel the uh, impacts of the uh, CO2 increase uh, that much. So uh, our Earth system is so complicated, so we never know if we uh, kind of uh, mess up that one part of the system, then what's going to be happening after that. So that's the uh, real uh, big fear that we have right now, that, uh, that uh, environmental perturbation by human may cause unknown disaster maybe next 10 years. So that's something we don't know. So as a scientist, we really want to try to address and predict those kind of issues. But systems are uh, just simply too complicated. So um, that's the, uh, so this is just one problem. So that I'm not trying to say that this is the whole problem, but I just explain to you that this is the one pro the, just one problem of the, uh, uh, the CO2 increase. And then let's take a look at the methane. So methane, actually rice farming actually emits a lot of methane because uh, the rice field has uh, some sort of bacteria actually that emits a lot of methane to the atmosphere. So it has been most dominant uh, methane uh, emitter um, passed after the 1860, but uh, the livestock start catching up, and then these days the dairy process, the uh, growing up there, especially uh, cows, uh, uh, um, operation actually emitting the, a lot of uh, uh, methane. So let's take a look at this two YouTube video explaining the uh, methane. One is well known, and then one is not really well known process. So let's take a look at this thing first. Gas from cows. It's something most humans don't think about on a regular basis. However, cow flatulence and burps pose quite a problem for the environment. According to a recent report, cow gas is responsible for nearly 30% of all human-related methane emissions. They heat up the planet, greatly contributing to the global warming effect. The Sustainable Agriculture flagship in Australia has created a new invention which may help with the problem. They will place robot-like, wireless, linked contraptions into cows' stomachs to keep track of exactly how much methane they are releasing. Researchers will then use that specific information to change the animal's diet to reflect more eco-friendly plant options, hence reducing the mass amounts of methane. The device is referred to as a gas-sniffing submarine, utilizing infrared sensors to record methane emissions. Other than cows, some researchers believe that dinosaurs contributed significantly to global warming. The theory is that, like cattle and other cut chewing animals, dinosaur flatulence contained methane, and the larger the mass, the larger the emission. Scientists believe that plant-eating dinosaurs were probably discharging over 550 million tons of methane per year. So, actually, you, you know, kind of process to bring the uh, nice beef steak um, on the uh, um, dinner table, actually uh, emitting a lot of uh, methane. So have you guys ever heard about UN is pushing actually insects as a, a protein a source, as a food source? So um, that's one uh, reason behind of it is actually uh, kind of for the developing people in the developing world needs their more nutrition, so they just push that uh, insect as a um, protein source. But the other actually uh, motivation was that just changing some fraction of the protein um, consumption by non-methane emitting um, source like insect may uh, be able to, we may be able to decrease the methane emission to the atmosphere. So that's the another actually motivation behind of it. 
So that's one thing. So this is actually time bomb thing. Just take a look at this. We have cleared the snow off the surface of the lake. And in order to see methane bubbles that are in the lake ice. And if you look at the shore, you can see that there are lots of trees that are falling in the lake and they're dying. What's happening is the permafrost is falling. The ice that was in the ground, when it melts, causes the ground surface to collapse. When the forest falls in, and any organic matter, dead plant and animal remains that were in the permafrost, thaw out in the bottom of the lake, microbes decompose it, and it generates methane. And methane doesn't like to stay in the water in solution. It forms bubbles, and those bubbles uh, make their way to the surface. In the summertime, the bubbles pop and they enter the atmosphere. In the winter, however, this ice forms a cover on the surface of the lake. And the bubbles get trapped right under the ice, and the ice thickens and freezes around them. And so what we have out here is like a time-lapse photograph of methane emissions from the lakes. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. A molecule of methane is 25 times stronger than carbon dioxide. Methane is formed in millions of lakes around the Arctic where permafrost is thawing. And each year, these lakes are emitting already tremendous amounts of methane. But when you look at how much carbon is in permafrost still frozen, and the potential for that permafrost to thaw in the future, we estimate that more than 10 times the amount of methane that's right now in the atmosphere will come out of these lakes. So if you take a look at this uh, um, plot here, the methane emission profile past over two, three hundred years, it has been uh, increasing without those methane from the Arctic region. But obviously, global warming um, make uh, that uh, Arctic uh, soil melting much faster. That means that uh, the uh, methane that trapped underneath of the ice of the Arctic, maybe someday it can be emitted to the atmosphere a lot. Uh, that uh, w was isolated from the atmosphere. So that may cause really significant problem in terms of global warming. So that's uh, another perspective of this methane, that unknown, very big unknown factor in terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, um, methane emission, okay? So now then uh, the question arises that if that kind of methane is similar to the atmosphere, we should call it air pollutants, well, we shouldn't call it air pollutants because the source of that thing is natural process. As you can see that the methane under the uh, um, permafrost is all from um, that, that trees, right? It's kind of bacteria decompose it, and then by that uh, process, um, they emit the methane to the atmosphere. But the uh, reason, if we uh, think that global warming is caused by the uh, human, then uh, the process that bringing the methane gas to the atmosphere is human-made cause, right? There's two competing kind of factors there. So think about whether uh, if that uh, huge methane can, uh, is emitted to the atmosphere, then we should call it pollutants, or we shouldn't call it pollutants, okay? Think about it. So uh, that's methane, um, sorry. So interestingly, people knew about that ex excess amount of these greenhouse gases may actually increase the temperature of the atmosphere. So first scientists actually uh, proposed that um, kind of hypothesis is uh, Arrhenius. He's a Swedish chemist. And then if you took the uh, um, kind of general chemistry, things like that, then uh, you may heard about his name. He is the person that kind of established physical uh, chemistry, theory, equilibrium, things like that. Um, um, kind of a reaction uh, processes in uh, uh, early uh, 1900. So you can just read it through that um, they realized CO2 can absorb IR, can heat it up the atmosphere, and they predicted it can be somewhere between 4 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius. So most complicated model that we have, which require gigantic uh, supercomputer, require you know, 100, 100, 100 hours of computing time, Actually, those models predict somewhere between two to five degrees Celsius. So just back of the envelope uh, calculation, four to eight is actually that, not that uh, bad calculation. And then actually his discussion is kind of hilarious. If you take a look at the, uh, this red uh, line right here, he's from Sweden, 
which is very northern part of the Europe. He thought this can be a good thing, right? So, um, you know, he, this can actually warm up our country. So it may be great that we have abundant crops in the, you know, in the future if uh, greenhouse gas warms up the atmosphere. But uh, obviously the, um, the outcomes of the, uh, uh, these greenhouse uh, gases is not that um, kind of a joyous as the uh, uh, Arrhenius was thinking about. So again, this is the most uh, recent snapshot. Uh, statistical stand, uh, standpoint, past about 100 years, more than 150 years, most warmest year, actually number one is now 24. So on top of number 10 list, so most of the number top, uh, on the number top list, most of the hottest year, warmest year, was past about 10 years. So that's the problem. And then if you take a look at the uh, global temperature anomaly, so this is uh, average, so basically difference between uh, 2011 and then uh, the average over 1951 to 90, 1980. So most of the, uh, most part of the world, um, the temperature gets higher, but the bigger problem right here is, so basically this is the temperature increase uh, depends on the uh, uh, latitude. So this is Arctic region, this is Antarctic region, right? So if you take a look at that, just like uh, ozone, that uh, temperature increase is uh, much higher in uh, Arctic region and the Antarctic region. And then Arctic region is uh, more severe um, they uh, experience most severe uh, warming trend uh, past 50 or 60 years. That's why we worry about that uh, methane emission from the permafrost of the Arctic because this part of the world gets much, much warmer, uh, vastly warmer than the other part of the world, okay? So this is again the statistics. And then some people, mostly uh, non-scientists, try to explain this warming trend, some other natural variation. So one thing you can easily think of is the energy from the sun. So again, it is all about energy balance. So energy from the sun, so because Earth is flat body, that's energy of Earth is emitting. And then this happened to be IR, and then this is sensible heat. Which means that if, you have, if we somehow get the more energy from the sun, then Earth is going to be getting warmer, right? So, um, but the clearly the data indicate that. So basically this is the energy coming from the sun past about 30 years, right? So this is kind of oscillating somewhere between 3065 to 3067. So less than 1%, there's some oscillation there. But there's no clear trend, increasing trend that can be, that can explain the temperature increase over past 30 years. So this is out, basically, right? So um, how about even longer uh, picture? Because this observation, so solar uh, radiation observation out of the space is only available when we have the satellite. So past, you know, um, before uh, early 80, we don't have this uh, capability to observe uh, solar uh, radiation energy directly out of the space. But one thing we can uh, indirectly uh, kind of uh, speculate uh, about the uh, solar energy is just counting sunspot. That's somehow related with um, that uh, energy that sun is emitting. So this is sunspot. So when um, sun has more sunspot, then that means there's uh, uh, somehow correlated with the, uh, uh, the energy emitted from the sun. So there was some obviously some uh, oscillation, but there's no clear trend as uh, the temperature increase has shown as I showed you uh, past few plots. But there's some uh, time uh, frame, uh, 1650 to 1700, that um, there's some um, very low counts of a, a sunspot was observed. As actually, this happens to be uh, that Earth is very cold at the time. So if you take a look at the artwork that's from the uh, um, southern uh, Italy, place like that, usually don't have any winter and snow. Um, 
in that part of the world, but uh, the artwork from this time frame, actually the lake get frozen, you can uh, take a look at the um, people actually doing skate over the lake, things like that. So obviously this, there's some um, impact from the sun can make that uh, the, um, the temperature of the surface, but simply this trend observation simply cannot uh, explain the temperature increase past 50 or 60, uh, uh, past about uh, 300 years. So uh, currently, the best knowledge that we have is that the temperature increase are caused by these greenhouse uh, gases. And then uh, the, the, uh, the specific processes, uh, these uh, gases absorb IR, is the uh, um, um, vibration, vibr yeah, vibrational transition. And then we somehow uh, build up uh, the concentration of these greenhouse gases too much, and then that warms up the atmosphere. So that's the uh, best scientific knowledge that we have at this time point. Okay, so this is the summary. So um, we have now new report from IPCC uh, 2013, but this is previous version. So this is the uh, uh, human-made uh, radioactive forcer. So radioactive forcer means that the stuff that human make and then uh, put into the atmosphere, and then those kind of uh, uh, human-made stuff can uh, warm the atmosphere or can cool down the atmosphere too. So CO2, so increase of CO2 between 1750 to 2005 basically warms up the atmosphere this much, okay? So that's the, uh, how much CO2 warms up the atmosphere. So again, the, uh, the unit is watts per square meter, right there, right? So we don't have right there a PPB as like there because it factored in the concentration of this uh, uh, gas species, CO2 there. And then methane and N2O is second most important greenhouse gases. And then this arrow bar right there is that in uh, current uh, scientific understanding, our uh, uh, uncertainty range is this much. So we definitely know that CO2 warms up the atmosphere, and then these guys uh, uh, warms up the atmosphere, okay? So some other thing, like ozone in the troposphere, it warms up, but the error bar is larger than uh, this one, right? And then stratospheric ozone actually cooling down the Earth, right? Anybody can guess that why stratospheric ozone cooling down the earth? Extra credit. This may motivate you. No? Oh, because... <clears throat> Think about it. I'm serious. Extra credit. Shoot it. Because. Oh, because it's in, if something is heating up, something else is cooling down. So the stratosphere is cooling down. You know, that's not uh, that it. You're right, actually. So basically, um, again, energy from the sun, energy that emits the Earth, right? Then um, if we have more ozone in the stratosphere, that means that the en least energy actually gets you into the surface in the UV region, right? So basically, ozone filtered away that uh, uh, specific UV energy. So less energy will get down to the Earth's surface, right? So that actually down this part of the equation. So email me, really. I, I haven't decided you know, how many points for extra credit, but I will definitely give you some. Um, so uh, that's the uh, theory of ozone. And then black carbon, we talked about that warms up the atmosphere. And land use change can cool down. Actually, the big, big, big uncertainty is about the aerosol in the atmosphere. So most of the aerosol, except the black carbon, I probably I should try again. You guys, it looks like a little bit motivated by this thing. So why the aerosol particle in the atmosphere overall cool down the atmosphere? Extra credit. Go for it. They reflect energy back um, instead of absorbing it. 
Email me, that's the right answer. Uh, so basically, aerosol again, reflecting the uh, uh, solar radiation. So uh, decrease this thing so that uh, energy, the, the, the temperature of the Earth is going to be decreased, right? So uh, you can talk a lot by just seeing uh, this one plot. But if you take a look at this aerobar, it's huge. So that means that currently with our best scientific knowledge, we don't have really kind of nailed down prediction on how much this aerosol is going to be cooling down the atmosphere. So for example, if aerosol cool down this much, the highest range that science can predict, right? If it is this much, then basically we can cancel out the CO2, the warming up, the CO2, right? Uh, by the CO2. And then if it is not as much as we think, then global warming from greenhouse gases is going to be much, much more faster than we think, OK? So um, currently, scientists really try to understand this uncertainty. And the next class, we will discuss about there's one or two scientists claim that this will be our solution. This will just save us from the, uh, this global warming issue. So uh, we will discuss about it this uh, next class. Oh, come on. I have three minutes. I think I have a few more slides here. So, so OK, this is the last slide. So do you understand this thing, right? That should we just go over several times. So um, this is a kind of an exception of the aerosol that actually warms up the atmosphere because of the color of this thing. But in general, aerosol in the atmosphere actually cooling down the, uh, uh, the uh, Earth's uh, temperature. All right, that's it today. See you Tuesday. <laughs>